Islam is an honest reporter's kryptonite. Take a seasoned journalist on a groundbreaking news program and ask him to give you the simplest, most basic information about Muhammad and the Quran, that reporter will suddenly turn into the most pathetic, trembling, sniveling, cowardly, journalistic jellyfish you've ever seen in your entire life. I haven't any courage at all. I even scare myself. <laughs> Since all the Scooby Snacks in the world won't convince anyone in the mainstream media to flee the fortress of dimitude, the task now falls to viewers like us to demand some degree of journalistic integrity. We can do this by watching various news specials about Islam and exposing the endless supply of false claims and misrepresentations they assume we're too stupid to spot. If the networks start losing credibility over their dishonest reporting, if their inaccuracies become a source of embarrassment, maybe they'll be a bit more careful the next time they decide to do a puff piece on the religion of puff piece. Is my nose bleeding? <laughs> there are plenty of news programs out there in dire need of a good public flogging, and I intend to go through as many of them as possible in the coming months. But where do we begin? Well, to keep things simple, let's go alphabetically. ABC News masterfully demonstrated what we might call the frightened ostrich method of reporting in their 2020 special, Islam, Questions and Answers. Our questions about Islam were answered by Diane Sawyer, Bill Weir, and Lama Hassan, the three blind mice of primetime political correctness. Let's see how they run. We're just like everybody else. Being a Muslim in America, my opinion doesn't make me any different than anyone else. 110% American. If ABC had called this program What Westernized Muslims Believe, I wouldn't have a problem with Muslims saying we're just like everyone else. But this program is called Islam, Questions and Answers. ABC is supposedly giving us information about Islam, not about Westernized Muslims who wouldn't know the Quran from a phone book. What does Islam teach about Muslims? Chapter 3, verse 110 of the Quran says to Muslims, You are the best of peoples ever raised up for mankind. Muslims are the best people in the world. How about Jews and Christians? Surah 98, verse 6 reads, Verily, those who disbelieve in the religion of Islam, the Quran, and Prophet Muhammad, from among the people of the Scripture, Jews and Christians, and al-Mushrikun will abide in the fire of hell. They are the worst of creatures. We are the worst of creatures. Muslims are the best of peoples. According to the Quran, then, are Muslims just like everyone else? Not a bit. ABC had a chance to explain this, but accurate information about Islam just wasn't a priority in their 2020 special on Islam. In the beginning, Adam and Eve. Though in Islam, God created them equally out of dust, not one from the other. Adam and Eve were created equally from dust, according to the Quran. Diane doesn't give us a reference for this lovely teaching, and she couldn't if she tried, because the Quran doesn't say it. What does the Quran say? Surah 4.1 O oh mankind, be dutiful to your Lord, who created you from a single person, Adam, and from him, Adam, he created his wife, Eve. Surah 7.189 it is he who hath created you from one person, and out of him produced his wife, that he might dwell with her. If that's not clear enough, in Sahih al-Bukhari 3331, Muhammad said, Woman is created from a rib. Are men and women created equally from dust in Islam? Only if Diane Sawyer turns out to be a higher authority than Muhammad and the Quran. Good luck with that, Diane. And until Jesus comes, in the Quran, he sits at the right hand of God. Jesus sits at the right hand of God. That's what Christians believe, but is that what the Quran says? Once again, no chapter, no verse. Why? Because the Quran never says it. The Quran does say in Surah 355 and Surah 4158 that Allah raised Jesus to himself, but that's not the same thing as saying that Jesus now sits at the right hand of Allah. 
According to Muhammad in Sahih al-Bukhari 3430, Jesus is in the second heaven with John the Baptist, several heavens away from Allah, certainly not at Allah's right hand. And also in the Quran, the heart of Islam, Muhammad's five pillars. Sorry, Diane, but the five pillars don't come from the Quran. They come from the Hadith. You won't find the Shahada in the Quran. You won't find pray five times a day in the Quran. You won't find a list of five pillars in the Quran. I'm pointing this out because this is as basic as it gets, and you're not even getting this right. Now, the reality is that the vast majority of Muslims in the United States are not mosque-attending kinds of Muslims, and that's okay. It's okay for Muslims to do other things when they're supposed to be at the mosque? Seriously? In Sahih al-Bukhari, 657, Muhammad was about to burn Muslims alive and burn their houses to the ground because they didn't show up for prayer. It seems Muhammad took this whole mosque thing pretty seriously. But not to worry, all you Muslims who don't want to go to the mosque, ABC News has a thoroughly westernized Muslim woman telling you it's okay to ignore your prophet's commands. And Muhammad said that we should all be tolerant of each other's religion. No source, Diane? No chapter and verse? I hereby invite anyone from any planet to show me where Muhammad said we should all be tolerant of each other's religions. Never happened. But Muhammad did say, fight those who believe not in Allah. O oh, you who believe, fight those of the unbelievers who are near to you and let them find in you hardness. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and those who are with him are severe against disbelievers and merciful among themselves. I have been commanded to fight against people till they testify that there is no God but Allah. O oh, you who believe, do not take the Jews and the Christians for friends. They are friends of each other. I will expel the Jews and Christians from the Arabian Peninsula and will not leave any but Muslims. I guess that's almost like telling people we should all be tolerant of each other's religions. As long as you live in opposite world with bizarro reporter Diane Sawyer. And after he died, history saw the first real interfaith era. For hundreds of years, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, and atheists, uh, lived together, debated God, debated religion. Welcome to Fantasyland. Population, anyone who watches ABC News. According to Muslim sources, after Muhammad died, Abu Bakr went on a killing spree against all the people who tried to leave Islam because they'd only become Muslims in the first place to avoid getting slaughtered by Muhammad. Umar took over after Abu Bakr and he forced Christians to sign an agreement, the Pact of Umar, saying they wouldn't build churches, repair damaged churches, sing loudly in their churches, or wear crosses. They had to give up their seats for Muslims, they had to feed Muslims, and they had to let Muslims sleep in their churches. And if the Christians ever violated any of these rules, the penalty was death. Over the next 14 centuries, more than 270 million people were slaughtered in the name of Islamic Jihad. Christians, Jews, Hindus, Zoroastrians, everyone who refused to become Muslims. And Diane Sawyer and ABC News whitewash all of it, describing life under Islamic rule as an interfaith paradise. It's kind of offensive, isn't it? Is it true, though, that those words should then supersede anything he said earlier? Not at all. In Surah 2, 106 and Surah 16, 101, the Quran says that later teachings abrogate earlier teachings. Not at all. Muhammad said that later teachings abrogate earlier teachings. Not at all. All classical Muslim scholars said that later teachings abrogate earlier teachings. Not at all. Who challenges the doctrine of abrogation? ABC News. So, there you go. 14 centuries of Muslim scholarship and reality itself get tossed out the window. While a fundamentalist Muslim follows Muhammad's instruction to fight the infidels, moderate scholars argue the infidels he was talking about were specific enemies that have been dead for 1,300 years. Wow. Muhammad's violent teachings only applied to a few enemies for a certain period of time. Of course, Muhammad didn't interpret it that way. The rightly guided caliphs didn't interpret it that way. Muhammad's companions didn't interpret it that way. Centuries of Muslim leaders and scholars didn't interpret it that way. 
But none of that matters, because world-renowned Quran scholar and theologian Bill Weir tells us that when the Quran says to Muslims, fight those who believe not in Allah, it doesn't really mean what it says. Maybe we can get Bill to write his own commentary. He could explain why 14 centuries of Muslims didn't understand the Quran at all. And the Quran only calls for jihad against invaders threatening a Muslim home. I'll tell you what, Bill, I'll read the verse, and you tell me where you're getting confused. Surah 929. Fight. Fight whom? Fight invaders? No. Fight those who believe not in Allah. So, this is fighting people based on what they believe. Fight those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book, that's Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Does that sound like it has anything to do with fighting invaders? No. Do you know why? Because it has nothing to do with fighting invaders. It's a command to fight unbelievers. And when this verse was revealed, Muslims began their long tradition of offensive jihad, fighting to subjugate all non-Muslims. You won't learn any of this from ABC News, though. Is there anything in the Quran that promises 72 virgins for a, for a holy martyr? I don't see any evidence in the Quran for the pledge of 72 virgins. This notion of 72 virgins actually comes from a mistranslation, uh, with the real translation being 72 raisins. There are actually two separate errors here. Ursad Manji seems to think that the number 72 comes from the Quran. doesn't. That comes from the Hadith. Then she tells us the Quran doesn't say Muslims will get virgins in paradise. It says they'll get raisins. So the hordes of the Quran are raisins, not virgins. This is a mangled edition of an argument by Christoph Luxemburg. The main problem with Ersad Manji's claim is what the Quran says about these hordes. The Quran says Muslims will marry the Hordes. It says the Hordes will be chaste and beautiful. It says the Hordes will have beautiful eyes and large breasts and that they'll love their husbands. It's fine with me if Irsad wants to translate Hordes as raisins, but if she does, Islam just got a lot creepier. He says bestsellers like The Way of the Muslim are often quoted in place of the Quran and contain dangerous ideas. Which means the blood money or the compensation for killing of the disbeliever is half of the blood money of the Muslim man. When you devalue the life of non-Muslims, that is the root cause of the problem. Terrorism is the last step. Now, this is just hilarious. Radical Muslims are quoting books in place of the Quran, and they're using these modern books to justify killing. What's the real source of terrorism? Devaluing the lives of non-Muslims by saying that the blood money for killing a non-Muslim is half as much as the blood money for killing a Muslim. How did these modern Muslim authors ever come up with such a horrible teaching? They got it from Muhammad, Sunan Abu Dawud, 4527. The value of the blood wit in the time of the Apostle of Allah was 800 dinars, or 8,000 dirhams, and the blood wit for the people of the book was half that for Muslims. Are you catching this? According to ABC News, the real source of jihad and terrorism isn't Muhammad's teachings. No, the violence springs from modern books by modern Muslim authors who, as you just saw, are getting their views directly from Muhammad's teachings. And radicals have used these murder and martyr myths. Murder and martyr myths. All this talk about jihad and fighting unbelievers and martyrdom, it's all based on myths. 
Guess that's why Muhammad said in Sahih al-Bukhari 2797, By him in whose hands my soul is, I would love to be martyred in Allah's cause, and then come back to life, and then get martyred, and then come back to life again, and then get martyred, and then come back to life again, and then get martyred. Just myths. Dictators combine that resentment with a perverted version of Islam and manipulate their people with a holy hatred of America. Dictators use a perverted version of Islam to incite hatred against America. Let me break this down for you because a drugged monkey could figure this one out. Listen to the Quran. This is Surah 5, verse 33. The punishment of those who wage war against Allah and his apostle and strive to make mischief in the land is only this, that they should be murdered or crucified or their hands and their feet should be cut off on opposite sides or they should be imprisoned. Here we have various penalties for making mischief in a Muslim land depending on the severity of the offense. The worst form of mischief making is bringing a non-Muslim military into a Muslim country. Has the United States done that? Yes, what's the penalty according to the Quran? Death. Do Muslim leaders need to pervert Islam in order to fuel hatred against America? No, they just need the Quran. A fatwa is nothing more than just one cleric's opinion. You could issue a fatwa that Coke is evil and you should drink Pepsi. Fatwas are a dime a dozen. They are meaningless. Fatwas are meaningless? No more than opinions. Fatwas are rulings by Muslim scholars based on Muhammad's teachings. They don't carry any additional weight beyond the quotations from Muhammad and the Quran, but they're definitely not meaningless. They contain the commands of Allah and Muhammad. Does the Quran teach the practice of al taqiyya lying to non-Muslims to advance and protect Islam? According to the experts, an obscure law called al taqiyya did allow early Muslims to deny their faith, but only under the threat of persecution. Recall the woman's question. Does the Quran teach the practice of taqiyya, deceiving non-Muslims? Unlike ABC News, I'll actually quote the Quran for you. Surah 3, 28. Let not the believers take disbelievers for their friends in preference to believers. Whoso doeth that hath no connection with Allah unless it be that ye but guard yourselves against them, taking, as it were, security. According to this verse, which uses a form of the word taqiyya, meaning concealment, in order to guard yourself, Muslims are not allowed to be friends with non-Muslims unless they're outnumbered and they feel like they're in danger from a stronger adversary. That's when Muslims are allowed to pretend to be friendly. One of Islam's greatest scholars, Ibn Kathir, comments, in this case, such believers are allowed to show friendship outwardly, but never inwardly. Abu Darda, one of Muhammad's companions, put it this way, We smile in the face of some people, although our hearts curse them. As for ABC's claim that taqiyya is just an obscure law for early Muslims, Muhammad's companion al Hasan said, Taqiyya is allowed until the day of resurrection. So Muslims have a choice. They can either go with the Quran and Muhammad and Muhammad's companions and Islam's greatest scholars and deceive us by smiling in our faces while cursing us in their hearts, or they can go with ABC's Bill Weir, who, although he knows next to nothing about Islam, does do a remarkable impression of putty from Seinfeld. Is Islam inherently violent? Yeah, that's right. Does Islam oppress women? Yeah, that's right. Does it advocate barbaric punishments? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. right. Savage. A chimp's all right. I find. The Quran is very, very clear that in the eyes of God, men and women have equal rights and equal responsibilities. Surah 4.3 says that men can marry up to four women. Do women get to marry up to four men? No. Surah 4.24 says that Muslim men can have sex with their female captives and slave girls. Do women get to have sex with their male captives and slave boys? No. Surah 434 says that men can beat their wives into submission. Do women get to beat their husbands into submission? No. 
So do men and women have equal rights and responsibilities in the Quran? No. Men and women are about as equal as hammers and nails in the Quran. At the Prophet Muhammad's own beloved first wife, uh, Khadija, was a wealthy, self-made entrepreneur. Now, Irsad Manji is correct when she says that Khadija was a wealthy entrepreneur. So that's not an error. The error is that Irsad uses this as proof that men and women are equal in Islam. And here she's just being silly with her timeline. Khadija was a wealthy entrepreneur before Islam, before she married Muhammad, before Muhammad received his first revelation. So what does her status as a businesswoman tell us about Islam? Absolutely nothing. If we want to learn something about women in Islam, let's listen to someone with a little more experience of life with Muhammad. In Sahih al-Bukhari, 5825, Muhammad's child bride Aisha says, I have not seen any woman suffering as much as the believing women. According to Aisha, the mother of the faithful, the believing women, the Muslim women, were suffering more than the pagan women. And by the way, the context of this quotation is that a Muslim man had beaten his wife until her skin turned green. Aisha was complaining about Muslim women being brutally beaten by their Muslim husbands. She realized that non-Muslim women were much safer because their husbands didn't have a revelation from God advocating spousal abuse. But this doesn't matter at all to ABC because Muhammad, 15 years before he declared himself to be a prophet, married a rich old widow. Guess that settles things. And reminding us that all the peaceful American Muslims are part of America's first line of defense. Yes, moderate, peaceful Muslims are our first line of defense against those pesky extremists. Muslims are violently subjugating Christians and other religious minorities in Egypt, Iraq, Pakistan, Sudan, Nigeria, and everywhere else Muslims have power over unbelievers. Are all the peaceful, moderate Muslims stepping in to protect these non-Muslims? Are the peaceful, moderate Muslims the first line of defense for victims of Muslim aggression? Certainly not. But Diane Sawyer and ABC News are convinced that things will be different here in the U.S., where moderate groups like CARE constantly tell Muslims not to work with police or the FBI in locating and apprehending terrorists. By the way, there was a bonus blunder in the clip we just saw. Notice that ABC showed us a picture of Sadiq Abdul Malik, who, according to Diane Sawyer, is one of the moderate Muslims always prepared to protect us from extremists. Sadiq supports Revolution Muslim and the Taliban. He defended Nadal Malik Hassan after the Fort Hood massacre, and he calls for the destruction of Israel. But hey, I'm sure he's quite ready to save us from all the radicals he supports. It's my duty as an American Muslim to stand between you, the American non-Muslim, and the radicals who are trying to attack you. It's a Muslim's duty to stand between us and the radicals who are trying to carry out Muhammad's commands in the Quran and the Hadith. I'll tell you what, Imam Rauf, you show me that anywhere in the Quran or authentic Hadith and I will personally help you build a mosque at ground zero. But you won't show me, because you know this isn't what Islam teaches at all. In areas where Muslims make up a majority, the duty of Muslims is to violently subjugate all non-Muslims. In areas like the United States, where Muslims are in the minority, the duty of Muslims is to practice taqiyya, deceiving non-Muslims into believing that Islam is peaceful and tolerant. But you know this, Imam Rauf, because that's what you do for a living. And the lovely folks over at ABC News are all too happy to serve as your megaphone. I would dance and be merry, life would be a ding a dairy if I only had a brain. Well, that's 20 errors in an hour-long news program, and I could have pointed out more. Isn't it sad that if you want accurate information about Islam, you have to get it from the internet? because the major networks and their research departments with their endless trunks of money 
just can't seem to get anything right when they talk about Islam? If this were any other topic, and ABC News made this many mistakes, they'd lose all credibility. But since the topic is Islam, it's perfectly acceptable to broadcast total nonsense in an effort to make Islam sound better than it really is. ABC News, like so many other networks, is a taqiyya amplifier. Muslims come up with soothing lies, ABC pumps them into your living room. If you're as fed up as I am, I invite you to send this video to as many people as possible. We need to start holding networks accountable for misleading and deceiving their viewers, and we can do this by drawing attention to errors and correcting them. I guess the only question now is, who's next? Oh yeah, we decided to go alphabetically. So what comes after ABC? BBC. Stay tuned. America, one of the most important tasks for Muslim apologists here in the West is the desexualization of Islam. Islam allows sex with prepubescent girls, sex with up to four wives, sex with slave girls, sex with war captives. There was even a time when Islam allowed prostitution. It was called mutta. Sunnis believe that Muhammad eventually condemned the practice. Shias still believe mutta is okay. Muhammad had sex with at least nine wives on the same day. Yes, Muhammad was allowed to break the four-wife rule. After all, he was the one who was receiving the revelations. Nothing suspicious there. Muhammad had sex with his wife Aisha when she was nine years old. He had sex with his female captives and his slave girls. And Muhammad, according to Surah 3321 of the Quran, is the example that all Muslims are supposed to imitate. Islam proclaims that Muslim men who enter paradise will be given at least 72 virgins. We hear a lot about the number 72, but according to uh, the Hadith, 72 virgins is the minimum. A really good Muslim will receive far more women in paradise. According to Ibn Kathir, the greatest Islamic commentator of all time, Muslims in paradise will be able to have sex with 100 virgins a day. And in case Muslims are worried that they won't have the strength for that much sex, Muhammad promised that Allah will give them miraculous sexual abilities, including eternal erections. Now in the West, Muslims want to portray Islam as the pure, holy, uncorrupted worship of Allah. Islam is about modesty and self-control and decency. But when we open the Muslim sources and find a far greater emphasis on sex than we find in America or in any of the cultures Muslims routinely condemn, we start getting suspicious, we start asking questions, and when people start questioning and criticizing Islam, what do you do? You reinterpret your scriptures to make your religion more palatable to your audience. And this is the standard practice for many Muslims in the West. What's disturbing is that some of the top American television networks are now totally on board with the project. They're actually helping Muslims water down Muhammad's teachings in order to make Islam more attractive to Westerners. ABC News, you'll remember, went so far as to promote the radical group Revolution Muslim as America's first line of defense against radicalism. ABC has dedicated some of their best reporters to the task of painting a rosy picture of Islam. So, ABC, let's focus on just one of the questions you answered for us in your 2020 special. What about all those virgins in paradise? That's a concern to some of us in the West. Do you think you could get someone to reinterpret Muhammad's teachings for us? Is there anything in the Quran that promises 72 virgins for a, for a holy martyr? I don't see any evidence in the Quran for the pledge of 72 virgins. This notion of 72 virgins actually comes from a mistranslation, uh, with the real translation being 72 raisins and other more modern books distort the scripture even more. 72 raisins? 72 raisins. 72 raisins? 72 raisins. Raisins? 
72 raisins. These things? 72 raisins. Why not just go to the grocery store? 72 raisins. You see, all those terrorists and suicide bombers shouldn't have listened to their shakes. They should have gone to ABC News for the correct interpretation of the Quran. Then they would have realized that Islam only promises raisins, not virgins, in paradise. And let's face it, who's going to blow himself up for a box of raisins? Ursad Maji claims that the term Horis should be translated as raisins. Now, just to make this easy for Ms. Manji, I'm going to throw out all of the hadith, all of the Sarah literature, all of the commentaries, and all of their clear descriptions of sex with Horis. That's where we get the real details about Muhammad's paradise. But let's just go with the Quran on this one. What does the Quran say about the Horis Muslims will receive in paradise? Surah 44, 51 through 54. As for the righteous, they shall be lodged in peace together amid gardens and fountains, arrayed in rich silks and fine brocade. Even thus, and we shall wed them to dark-eyed Horis. So, Muslims are going to marry these Horis. Surah 52, 20. They will recline with ease on thrones arranged in ranks, and we shall marry them to Horis, female fair ones, with wide lovely eyes. Again, Muslims are going to marry their Horis. Surah 55, 54 through 56. They shall recline on couches lined with thick brocade, and within reach will hang the fruits of both gardens. Which of your Lord's blessings would you deny? Therein are bashful virgins, whom neither man nor genie will have touched before. Bashful virgins never touched by man or by genies. Surah 55, 70 through 74. In each of the gardens there shall be virgins chaste and fair. Which of your Lord's blessings would you deny? Dark-eyed virgins sheltered in their tents. Which of your Lord's blessings would you deny? Whom neither man nor genie will have touched before. These virgins are going to be chaste. Surah 56, 22 through 24. And there will be companions with beautiful, big, and lustrous eyes, like unto pearls well guarded, a reward for the deeds of their past life. These Horis will have beautiful, lustrous eyes. Surah 56, 35 through 38. Verily we have created them, maidens, of special creation, and made them virgins, loving their husbands only, equal in age, for those on the right hand. The Horis will be very loving. Surah 78, 31 through 34. Surely, for the God-fearing, awaits a place of security, gardens and vineyards and maidens with swelling breasts, like of age and a cup overflowing. The Horis will have swelling breasts. Let's put all of this together. According to ABC News, Muslims in paradise will get married to beautiful-eyed, large-breasted, chaste, loving raisins that have never been touched by man or jinn. That's your story, ABC? If I were a Muslim, I think I would actually be upset at this distortion. Go ahead and try to insert the word raisins into some of the verses we looked at. And we shall marry them to... Raisins. ...with wide, lovely eyes. Surely, for the God-fearing, awaits a place of security, gardens and vineyards and raisins with swelling breasts. Is ABC News accusing Muslims of being attracted to raisins? Oh, the Islamophobia being attracted to raisins would be much, much weirder than being attracted to virgins. It's grapeophilia. Do you like dried fruit? Convert to Islam. You'll get to marry some large-breasted raisins. ABC did this over and over again in their special about Islam. They would raise a question, an important question, like why is there such an emphasis in Islam on deflowering virgins in paradise? And then they'd give an answer that can't possibly be correct. All you have to do is open up the Quran and you'll see that the Quran can't possibly be referring to raisins. 
And then after misleading millions of Americans, ABC would move on to the next topic. When did it become the job of American television networks to deceive Americans, to water down the facts, and to help propagate Islam? I don't know. But the sooner people realize what's going on, the sooner we can start demanding accurate answers to our questions. Stay tuned, America. We've got a lot more to cover. Other than Muhammad's violent teachings, fighting unbelievers, killing apostates, etc., the biggest concern about Islam here in the West is Islam's position on women. We support women's rights in America, so many Americans would have a problem with a religion that teaches, for instance, that it's okay to beat women into submission. Fortunately for Western Muslims who want to propagate Islam, they're getting quite a bit of help from ABC News, and ABC seems to have no concern for truth or accuracy as they defend Muslim beliefs. Consider the following claim by ABC World News anchor Diane Sawyer. The Quran is filled with stories we all know. It talks about um, how the world began, I guess, from Adam and Eve, um, and that's what Islam is. In the beginning, Adam and Eve. Though in Islam, God created them equally out of dust, not one from the other. So, Judaism and Christianity claim that Eve was created from Adam. But Islam, according to ABC, teaches that Adam and Eve were created equally from dust. I guess the implication here is that women are inferior in Judaism and Christianity since Eve was created from Adam. I'm not sure that reasoning works if you want to say that Eve was created from Adam, therefore Adam is superior to Eve. You'd also have to say, well, Adam was created from dust, therefore dust is superior to Adam, and that would just be silly. But let's toss all of that aside for now, because I have one major objection to Diane Sawyer's claim. It's totally, completely, and utterly false. What does the Quran say? O mankind, be dutiful to your Lord, who created you from a single person, Adam, and from him, Adam, he created his wife, Eve, and from them both he created many men and women. It seems that Allah created everyone from a single person, Adam, and also created Eve from Adam. But maybe we shouldn't be too hasty. Is there another verse in the Quran that tells us about Eve's creation? Indeed, there is. Surah 7, 189. It is he who hath created you from one person, and out of him produced his wife, that he might dwell with her. Interesting. Out of him, Adam, Allah produced his wife, Eve. Since Eve was created from Adam, the Quran goes so far as to say that women in general were created from men. In Surah 30, 21, we read, And one of his signs is that he created mates for you from yourselves, so that you may find rest in them. If that isn't clear enough, let's go to one of the greatest Islamic commentaries on this verse, Tafsir Jalalain, which reads, And of his signs is that he created for you, from yourselves, mates. Eve was created from Adam's rib, and the remainder of mankind from the reproductive fluids of men and women. So, according to Tafsir Jalalain, Eve was created from Adam's rib. There is, however, a greater commentary out there, the most respected Muslim commentator of all time, Ibn Kathir. What does Ibn Kathir say on this issue? Allah commands his creatures to have taqwa of him by worshipping him alone without partners. He also reminds them of his ability in that he created them all from a single person, Adam, peace be unto him. And from him he created his wife, Hawa, Eve, who was created from Adam's left rib from his back while he was sleeping. Now, even though Ibn Kathir wrote Islam's most respected commentary on the Quran, there are even greater authorities on the meaning of the Quran than Ibn Kathir. Muhammad's companions Ibn Abbas and Ibn Masud are beyond question. Muhammad said that if you want to learn the Quran from anyone, learn it from Ibn Masud. And Ibn Abbas was the founder of Quranic studies. 
Fortunately, we have a narration that goes back to both of them. It reads, Adam was settled in paradise. Adam used to go about there all alone, not having a spouse to dwell with. He fell asleep, and when he woke up, he found sitting at his head a woman who had been created by God from his rib. Wait a minute, what am I thinking? I've totally left out the greatest authority on the teachings of Islam, Muhammad himself. I wonder what Muhammad had to say about the creation of women. Allah's Messenger said, Treat women nicely, for a woman is created from a rib, and the most curved portion of the rib is its upper portion. So, if you should try to straighten it, it will break, but if you leave it as it is, it will remain crooked. So, treat women nicely. Muhammad, the greatest authority on Islam, says that woman was created from a rib. What does this give us? The Quran, the Hadith, the Tafsir, and the Sirah all agree that Eve was created from Adam. Muhammad, Ibn Masud, Ibn Abbas, Ibn Kathir, the two Jalals, everyone agrees that Eve was created from Adam. And who do we have giving us the opposing view that Adam and Eve were created equally from dust? World-renowned theologian and Quran expert, Diane Sawyer. In the beginning, Adam and Eve. Though in Islam, God created them equally out of dust, not one from the other. Irshad Manji, an Islamic reformer, believes the Quran can be interpreted along more feminist lines. The Quran is very, very clear that in the eyes of God, men and women have equal rights and equal responsibilities. At the Prophet Muhammad's own beloved first wife, uh, Khadija, was a wealthy, self-made entrepreneur. All right, ABC, you've finally managed to tick me off. You just told millions of people that according to Islam, men and women have equal rights and responsibilities before Allah. And what evidence does Ursad Manji give? She says that Khadija was a wealthy, self-made entrepreneur. I wonder why Miss Manji failed to mention the fact that Khadija was a wealthy, self-made entrepreneur before Islam, before she married Muhammad, before Muhammad even began receiving revelations. In other words, if Khadija's social status is evidence of equality between men and women, it would be evidence of equality between men and women in pagan Mecca, before the rise of Islam. But ABC News doesn't tell us any of that. All we get is the misrepresentation. So, why would ABC tell us that men and women are equal in Islam? I suspect it's because they know most people don't have the resources or the time to carefully examine what we see on the news. But I do. Let's take a look at what Islam really teaches about men and women. Surah 434 is always a good place to start. Men are in charge of women. Why? Because Allah hath made the one of them to excel the other. By nature, men excel women and because they spend of their property for the support of women. So good women are the obedience, guarding in secret that which Allah hath guarded. But what do you do if women get out of line? As for those from whom ye fear rebellion, admonish them, and banish them to beds apart, and scourge them. Then, if they obey you, seek not a way against them. The Qur'an is very, very clear. It certainly is, Miss Manji. So, men are in charge of women. They're superior to women, they excel women. And if women get out of line, men are commanded to beat them into submission. Sorry, ABC, but this doesn't sound like equality. Nor is there equality when it comes to how many marriage partners a person can have. Surah 4.3 says, and if you fear that you shall not be able to deal justly with the orphan girls, then marry other women of your choice, two or three or four. Yes, you heard that correctly. Muslim men can marry up to four women. Can Muslim women marry up to four men? No. Is this what you call equality, ABC? 
We should also note that Muslim men can have more sexual partners than just their four wives. Muslim men get to have sex with their war captives and slave girls, those whom their right hands possess. Consider Surah 23, 1 through 6. The believers must eventually win through those who humble themselves in their prayers, who avoid vain talk, who are active in deeds of charity, who abstain from sex, except with those joined to them in the marriage bond, or the captives whom their right hands possess, for in their case they are free from blame. What I find rather horrifying is that Muslims can have sex with their captives and slave girls, even if the captives and slave girls are married. Surah 424 declares that a Muslim man can't have sex with a married woman unless she's a captive or a slave girl. The verse reads, Also forbidden are women already married, except those captives and slaves whom your right hands possess. Do Muslim women get to have sex with their captives and slaves? No. That's not equality. So, Muslim men get to have sex with up to four wives, and as many sex slaves as they're able to capture or purchase. They also get to have sex with women in just about any way they can think of. The Quran discusses sexual positions in Surah 2, 223, which says, your wives are as a tilth unto you, so approach your tilth when or how ye will. The Quran is very, very clear. Let's look at a typical commentary on this verse. Tafsir Jalalain reads, Your women are a tillage for you, that is, the place where you sow the seeds of your children. So come to your tillage, that is, the specified place, the front part, in whichever way you wish, whether standing up, sitting down, lying down, from the front or the back. Do women get to demand sex in any position they see fit? No. That's not equality. So, things are certainly unequal in this life. What about the afterlife? In our video exposing the raisins myth, we saw that in paradise, Muslim men will receive a number of huris large-breasted virgins who are made to be the ultimate sex slaves. Will women receive huris? No, they'll continue being the wives of Muslim men. The only difference is that in paradise, women will now have to share their husbands with specially designed sex machines called huris. Muslim women of the world, I ask you, how does it feel knowing that in paradise you'll be competing for the affections of your husband with a ton of women who are designed to be the ultimate sex partners? This is assuming, of course, that you actually make it to paradise. Muhammad said that most of the inhabitants of hell are women. The prophet said, I saw the hellfire and I had never seen such a horrible sight. I saw that most of the inhabitants were women. The people asked, Oh, Allah's Apostle, why is it so? The Prophet said, Because of their ungratefulness. It was asked whether they are ungrateful to Allah. The Prophet said, They are ungrateful to their companions of life, husbands, and ungrateful to good deeds. So, according to Muhammad, most of the inhabitants of hell are women. The women are in hell because they're ungrateful to their husbands and because they don't perform enough good deeds. But this means that women are less moral than men, according to Muhammad. They're also less intelligent. In Surah 2, 282, the Quran discusses contracts, and we find that the testimony of a woman is worth half the testimony of a man. It says, And get two witnesses out of your own men. And if there are not two men available, then a man and two women, such as you agree for witnesses. So that if one of them, one of the two women, errs, the other can remind her. The Quran is very, very clear. According to Muhammad, the reason women aren't as reliable as men is that they're stupid. The Prophet said, Isn't the witness of a woman equal to half of that of a man? The women said, Yes. He said, This is because of the deficiency of her mind. Let's read a final passage that combines the lack of intelligence and the lack of good morals aspects of women. Muhammad said, O women folk, you should give charity and ask much forgiveness, for I saw you in bulk amongst the dwellers of hell. 
A wise lady among them said, Why is it, Messenger of Allah, that our folk are in bulk in hell? Upon this the Holy Prophet observed, You curse too much and are ungrateful to your spouses. I have seen none lacking in common sense and failing in religion, but at the same time robbing the wisdom of the wise besides you. Upon this the woman remarked, What is wrong with our common sense and with our religion? He, the Holy Prophet, observed, Your lack of common sense can be well judged from the fact that the evidence of two women is equal to one man. That is a proof of the lack of common sense. So, how exactly are women equal to men in Islam? They're not equal in intelligence or common sense. They're not equal in morality. They're not equal in the number of sexual partners they can have in this life or the afterlife. The value of their testimony isn't equal. Men are in charge of women. Men excel women. Men yet get to uh, beat women. Men and women aren't equal at all in Islam. And we didn't even have time to get to the veil or muta, temporary marriage that amounts to no more than prostitution, or the Quran allowing sex with prepubescent girls, etc. So, why does ABC News continue to mislead millions of viewers, trying desperately to convince us that Islam is perfectly compatible with Western values? Stay tuned. I assure you, we will get to the bottom of this. America, we've been examining some of the claims made by ABC News on their 2020 special, Islam Questions and Answers. We've seen that ABC was wrong when they suggested that radical Muslims are our first line of defense against terrorism. They were wrong when they said that the Quran teaches that Muslims will get raisins, not virgins, in paradise. They were wrong when they told us that Adam and Eve were created equally from dust, according to Islam. And they were wrong when they said that men and women have equal rights and responsibilities in Islam. Fortunately, we're now turning to an issue that even ABC News can't get wrong. Muhammad's intolerance towards non-Muslims. ABC messed everything else up, but let's face it, a drugged monkey could figure this one out. So, I guess I'll just sit back and drink a cup of tea while ABC World News anchor Diane Sawyer does what she does best and uses her journalistic expertise to expose Muhammad's clear commands to oppress and subjugate unbelievers. Let him have it, Diane. And Muhammad said that we should all be tolerant of each other's religion. What in the lowest pit of Hades did you just say? And Muhammad said that we should all be tolerant of each other's religion. Our differences are God's mercy. Our differences are God's mercy? You're telling us that Muhammad said these words. I wonder if the clip will make more sense if I play it backwards. <laughs> As you can see, I'm totally flabbergasted. Diane Sawyer made two distinct claims. First, Muhammad promoted tolerance towards people of different religions. Second, Muhammad said that our religious differences are a mercy from God. So, ABC News is telling us that Islam is tolerant. We could just take ABC's word for it, but let's do something crazy. Let's make sure our views actually correspond to reality. Did Muhammad promote tolerance towards unbelievers? I guess this would be a good time to ask a few obvious questions. For instance, when Muhammad started preaching Islam, how many pagans were in Mecca? A lot. How many pagans were in Mecca when Muhammad died two decades later? None. So what happened? Did Muhammad's religious tolerance eradicate paganism from Mecca? When Muhammad conquered Mecca, the Kaaba was surrounded by hundreds of idols that were very dear to the people of Arabia. What happened to all of those idols? They were smashed to pieces by the ever-so-tolerant Prophet of Islam. How many Jews were in Medina when Muhammad moved there? 
three large tribes. How many Jews were in Medina after eight years of Muhammad's leadership? Zero tribes. Interesting, Muhammad's religious tolerance has a way of obliterating all other religions. And Muhammad said that we should all be tolerant of each other's religion. Our differences are God's mercy. Here's a little known fact. According to Muslim sources, the pagans, the idol-worshipping polytheists of Mecca, were far more tolerant than the Muslims. Consider this passage from al tabris history, which refers to Muhammad's early preaching in Mecca. The Messenger of God proclaimed God's message openly and declared Islam publicly to his tribesmen. When he did so, they did not withdraw from him or reject him in any way, as far as I have heard, until he spoke of their gods and denounced them. Notice that the Meccans had no objections to Muhammad peacefully preaching Islam. It was only after the tolerant of all religions, Muhammad, started viciously attacking the beliefs of the Meccans that disputes began to arise. A few pages later, in Al-Tabari, we find that Muhammad was harassing the Meccans by mocking their gods and their values. One day the Meccans were discussing Muhammad and they said, We have never seen the like of what we have endured from this man. He has derided our traditional values, abused our forefathers, reviled our religion, caused division among us, and insulted our gods. We have endured a great deal from him. As they continued talking about Muhammad, he came up and said, Hear, men of Quraysh, by him in whose hand Muhammad's soul rests, I have brought you slaughter. Sounds like a threat. Muslims often complain about the intolerance of the pagans in Mecca. But don't ever forget that Muhammad preached in Mecca for more than a decade, and he made it out alive. After years of criticizing the religious beliefs of the people there, and even after threatening to slaughter them. Would I survive for ten years in Mecca today if I stood in the streets and mocked the religious beliefs of the people who live there? Would I last ten days? Ten minutes? We'll never know because, thanks to Muhammad's teachings, non-Muslims aren't even allowed in the city. And Muhammad said that we should all be tolerant of each other's religion. And Muhammad said that we should all be tolerant of each other's religion. And Muhammad said that we should all be tolerant of each other's religion. And Muhammad said that we should all be tolerant of each other's religion. So the pagans were far more tolerant of Muhammad and his followers. But that's the pagans. Islam has a higher view of Christians and Jews. We have to keep in mind, however, that according to Islam, there's a world of difference between Muslims on the one hand and Christians and Jews on the other. While Muslims are the greatest people in the world, Christians and Jews are the worst of creatures. The Quran declares in Surah 3, verse 110, Ye are the best of peoples, Muslims are the best of peoples, evolved for mankind, enjoining what is right, forbidding what is wrong, and believing in God. Who are the best people in the world? Muslims. And in Surah 98, 6 we read, Verily, those who disbelieve in the religion of Islam, the Quran, and Prophet Muhammad, from among the people of the scripture, Jews and Christians, and al-Mushrikun will abide in the fire of hell. They are the worst of creatures. Now, if we're the worst of creatures, and Muslims are the best people in the world, don't you think this might put an obstacle in the way of Muslims seeking genuine friendships with non-Muslims? Especially when the Quran says things like, O oh, you who believe, do not take the Jews and the Christians for friends. They are friends of each other. And whoever amongst you takes them for a friend, then surely he is one of them. But it gets worse. Christians and Jews are so bad, Muslims are actually commanded to fight us simply because of our beliefs. Surah 921 commands Muslims to fight those who believe not in Allah. What's that? Fight those who attack you first? No. Fight those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book, that's Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Muslims are commanded to fight us because of our beliefs until we pay them off. If that's not clear enough, we can always turn to Muhammad's words in Sahih Muslim. The Messenger of Allah said, I have been commanded to fight against people till they testify that there is no God but Allah, that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah, and they establish prayer and pay zakat. What's that, Muhammad? You've been commanded to fight people only in self-defense? No, you've been commanded to fight people until they become Muslims. And this is exactly what we find in the Quran. 
O oh, prophet, strive hard against the unbelievers and the hypocrites, and be unyielding to them, and their abode is hell, and evil is the destination. O oh, you who believe, fight those of the unbelievers who are near to you, and let them find in you hardness. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and those who are with him are severe against disbelievers, and merciful among themselves. Surely Allah has bought of the believers their persons and their property for this, that they shall have the garden. Well, since Allah has done all this for Muslims, what are they supposed to do in return? They fight in Allah's way, so they slay and are slain. And Muhammad said that we should all be tolerant of each other's religion. So Muhammad harassed the pagans for years. He derided their values, abused their forefathers, reviled their religion, caused division among them, and insulted their gods. That's what he did when he didn't have an army. When he was strong enough, Muhammad conquered Mecca, took over their temple, smashed their idols, and eventually issued the command to slay them wherever you find them. As for Christians and Jews, they're the worst of creatures, while Muslims are the best of peoples. Muslims can't be friends with Jews and Christians. Muslims are commanded to fight and subjugate Jews and Christians because of our beliefs. And Muslims are merciful among themselves, but severe against who? Unbelievers. But don't forget that Diane Sawyer did give us a piece of evidence to show that Muhammad preached tolerance. I've given you numerous quotations directly from the Quran and other trusted Muslim sources. What does Diane give us? Our differences are God's mercy. Our differences are God's mercy. Our differences are God's mercy. According to Diane Sawyer, we know that Muhammad preached tolerance towards all religions because he said that our differences are God's mercy. With this, ABC News may get the 2010 Golden Medallion for mind-bogglingly ridiculous scripture twisting. What did Muhammad actually say? I should probably point out that according to most Muslims, we don't know. Since the various versions of the quotation are classified as da'if, weak hadith that can't be trusted. Most Muslims reject weak hadith. Some scholars even say that the quotation doesn't go back to Muhammad at all. It goes back to a later Muslim. But I'm not crazy about the Muslim methodology, so let's grant ABC News their weak hadith. What does it actually say? Does it command Muslims to be tolerant towards everyone because different religious beliefs are God's mercy? No, it says, The difference of opinions of my companions is a mercy for my Ummah. The Ummah is the community of Muslims. Is there anything in this quotation about being tolerant towards other religions? Absolutely not. In fact, Muslim commentators are quite clear that this narration isn't even about Muslim doctrine, which they believe is set in stone. Instead, it has to do with certain differences of opinion concerning minor Muslim practices, the sorts of differences you'll find among the four schools of Islamic jurisprudence in Sunni Islam. The idea, according to Muslim scholars, is that if there were no differences of opinion among Muhammad's companions, any little mistake a Muslim made would classify him as an unbeliever. Therefore, it's good that there are differences of opinion when it comes to the little things. You can do some different things and not worry about accidentally apostatizing and having your head chopped off. That's why these differences are a mercy from Allah. But what does Diane Sawyer do with the passage? She doesn't give us the actual quotation, so we can't see what Muhammad really said. She doesn't give us the reference, so we can't even look it up. She totally twists the meaning from differences of opinion among Muhammad's companions are okay to differences among religions are okay. And she completely ignores all of the clear passages where Muhammad commands his followers to fight, subjugate, and even kill non-Muslims simply because they're non-Muslims. This is how ABC News convinces Western viewers that Muhammad was tolerant and peaceful. And Muhammad said that we should all be tolerant of each other's religion. Our differences are God's mercy. Now, given what we've seen in our past several videos, I have to ask ABC an important question. If you can only defend this religion by twisting the facts and inventing things and ignoring 
everything that even remotely resembles careful scholarship. If you can only make Islam seem compatible with Western values by misrepresentation and distortion and outright deception, doesn't this tell us something about Islam? If Islam really were the force of freedom and equality and tolerance that ABC News wants us to believe it is, wouldn't Diane Sawyer be able to open the Quran and the Hadith and prove her claims by accurately presenting us with the teachings of Islam? Shame on you, ABC. You've insulted your viewers, you've insulted our intelligence, and you've insulted centuries of victims of Muslim intolerance. Instead of drawing attention to the source of violence and oppression, you cover it up. You even praise it. And I'd say this makes you partially responsible for the blood of future victims of Islamic terror. We've been putting up with this for far too long, and I think I speak for millions of Americans when I say, enough already.